Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having us. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity to talk about the merger of the Bristol County Chamber and what was originally the South Coast Chamber in uh, in Fall River, New Bed Fall River and New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, two cities that are about 12 miles apart from down uh, the downtown offices. Um, it takes longer to get from the southern end of Fall River to the northern tip of Fall River than it does to get from the office in Fall River to the office in New Bedford. And, and that is, that, that, that sounds minuscule, but it's an in, extremely important point in the whole process of our, what became our merger. Uh, the two communities are industrial communities, uh, old manufacturing towns. New Bedford is still the largest active fishing port in the country. Um, they're uh, very, very heavily Portuguese and immigrant um, driven communities. Uh, both chambers had rebranded recently. There was a lot of competition. Um, there was a lot of mutual distrust um, and that's putting it mildly. Um, but uh, so in 2016, 17, 18, the two chambers had both rebranded, um, which turned out to be a little premature. Um, but both were very strong and viable chambers with long histories. Um, one starting in 1925, the other in 1885. And financially, when we came together, both chambers were very, very strong. We came together, as Susan mentioned, to form the second largest chamber in the state of Massachusetts in terms of number of members. Um, we, we had about 16, 1700 members in total. Uh, 1,500 uh, members now after you net out the, the members that were in both chambers. So moving to the next slide, uh, this attempt at, at coming together and the, our eventual success at coming together was actually on the heels of a lot of memories that our folks on our board had about 2006, where they attempted to come together and it was a dismal and cataclysmic failure. Uh, merger attempt number one uh, was kind of a lesson on how to do almost everything wrong. Uh, the board of directors formed, uh, the boards of directors formed six or seven different committees of members of the board to review every aspect and every fly spec of each chamber, all of their activity. And it, it ended up that those committees led to an incredible number of overlaps and contradictory information uh, that went back and forth among the six or seven different communities. Most importantly, I think one of the recommendations that came out of a governance committee uh, was to create something that was perceived as being an exclusionary governance policy, limiting the board size, which meant each, our organization had roughly 30 board members. Mike's organization had had, it was not under Mike at the time, nor was this under my, uh, me at the time, uh, also had roughly 30 board members. Uh, and the recommended board was about 25. Uh, what that meant was that we were asking our board members to vote themselves off the board. Uh, and that was something that proved to have produce, as is often the case in organizational mergers and, and conversations, more parking lot conversations than actual conversations that took place in, in public meetings uh, regarding it. Uh, so that exclusionary governance policy was something that really hurt the 2006 effort. Uh, we also had, and, I, and I, I, I mean this in the best possible way, we had two relatively weak chief executives, both of whom were basically on the way out within their organizations, uh, but neither was actually retiring yet. Uh, and so there was a kind of conversation at that point about whether one was essentially taking over the other if one of those chief executives ended up governing the or uh, running the organization. Uh, and then we learned fairly quickly as we went through notes of 2006, the perception was everything. A lot of it had, a lot of the conversations actually had very little to do with the facts of the organizations coming together, uh, but the way it was being perceived was something that was, that was uh, producing a lot of conversation uh, that actually had little basis in fact. Ultimately, there was a vote that, that took place in New Bedford and a vote that took place in Fall River. Uh, in New Bedford, it passed actually uh, unanimously, uh, but it failed narrowly in Fall River. And the two organizations went from that 2006 process uh, with, I think, some 
additional ill feelings about each other. Uh, and then the two organizations kind of went their separate ways and did their own merry things uh, from 2006 until, for about 12 years. So it was a long stretch of returning to a new normal that frankly only came about uh, when Mike O'Sullivan came in in Fall River uh, and I came in in New Bedford where we suddenly had different voices without a lot of the baggage uh, to help bring some of these things forward. Next, please. So in 2019, when you talk about the road to victory, it really started back in 2006, as Rick had just said. Um, the reality of the situation was when I, when I got hired, I did a lot of searching on Google. I talked to a handful of other folks who had worked in the Fall River and New Bedford chambers over the years, and I got a good understanding of what happened in 2006. Um, I think the search committee was, was sort of, uh, they were a little concerned and they were surprised, I think, when I knew as much as I did about what happened in 2006 when I got hired. But that really created a process and an understanding for me of where the existing board and in particular, the board, our board chair in uh, Fall River and Bristol, uh, where he stood. Uh, we had a lot of really good conversations. And coming from the outside, I wasn't afraid of looking at merging or integrating or however we wanted to call it at that time. I wanted to do what was right for the membership, do what was right for the community, and ultimately, which would be what is right for the chamber. Um, I was here for maybe two weeks, the first time when we sat down with uh, our board chair, Brian LeCompte, and the South Coast board chair, Kim Perry, uh, with myself and with Rick. And we just started talking in general. And the first thing we just started talking about was, what could we do together better? Ironically, the first thing we came up with was, let's not have our business after hours on the same night. That happened a lot, which was in my two weeks here. At that time, I heard a lot of complaints uh, from the membership because a lot of them wanted to go to both. Very, very actively engaged members, they always wanted to go to both. So, you know, we were able to solve simple problems like that. Um, Rick and I started showing up at things together. We'd actually sit together, uh, which was shocking to everyone in the community. Uh, you know, over the long time, ter uh, excuse me, long term, once we got the, the board to uh, really talked this through, uh, we ended up hiring an outside consultant, which really, it was expensive, but I don't think that this ever would have gotten done without it because he was able to take the bullets of all the hard decisions. He didn't really guide us to any decisions specifically, but when we needed to talk about the difficult pieces of the pie, uh, he was very good at helping us make those, make those points to both the executive committee and to the board. Uh, one of the best things we did was form one committee on integration to do all the due diligence. And we handpicked the people to be on that committee. Rick and I, we told the two board chairs who we really thought should be on it. We kept it small um, because if you get too many hands, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen, things, things fail. And that was one of the things that we had seen from 2006. There was way too many committees, way too much feedback and input, um, and we got to really talk about operations and what problems would, would occur and what, need, what, what not to do, which the first thing that we were told was by somebody who sat on one of the committees in 2006 told us, if there's 60 board members, you got to have 60 board members less duplication, meaning duplication, meaning any companies that had uh, somebody on both boards. Uh, and the reason being, we, as Rick had said earlier, we didn't want anybody to be able to vote themselves. Um, we prepared, we prepared like eight inch binders on both chambers into one binder with all the documents, all the bylaws, everything, so that when we would meet, we would talk, it would be at our fingertips. Uh, and we all had a good understanding of exactly how the other chamber did it. We had to define what some of the sacred cows were uh, and, the, and the developing and non-negotiables, those two sort of go hand in glove. Um, the first sacred cow, obviously, was keeping the board very large, which we don't really, we didn't want, but we needed to do it in order to execute the actual merger. Um, 
we've got it in there and right now we've got 49 people on the board but there's a long-term plan to bring it down to 35 which is a much more manageable useful useful figure the other non-negotiables were there would be no layoffs uh, you're going into my next slide buddy. I'm still, I'm still on the road to victory. Um, yeah, but my non-negotiables are the next slide. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that alone then. Um, and then we had to come to a single recommendation, which we did. So I'll give turn it over to Rick now. Okay, Doug. Thanks, Mike. Uh, our, uh, the key to success, as Mike was talking about, were those non-negotiables. And we had to, we were kind of lucky. This was a pre-COVID-19 uh, period of time. Uh, where we actually had the opportunity to look at two financially viable organizations coming together. <coughs> we also knew, <coughs> excuse me, that there was always the possibility uh, that any successes that we were having with our board at the board level could possibly be undone by staff, many of whom had been there for many, many years, uh, who may be nervous about what was going on. So one of the first non-negotiables we created was that all staff would have a job at a similar rate of, at the same rate of pay, even though their duties might change. That both physical offices would be retained. And politically here, that was something uh, that was essential. Uh, we talked about, uh, Mike talked about the board continuing to represent it of roughly 50, uh, that the new name would be neither of our current names. Uh, there was little stuff like this that, believe it or not, can be major stumbling blocks. Our emphasis was always going to be on impacts over efficiencies. So we were emphasizing and the committee was working in what were the great positive impacts that could come together, not working on how do we trim budgets in order to make uh, this thing work. So in our case, it was really about impacts uh, and that the new chamber would be led by co-CEOs. It came out of that committee that, that Mike and I uh, would find our way of working together in order to keep the organization going forward through this merger Nobody in their right minds would design a co-CEO model. We know that. Uh, but for the period of time of this transition, it's something that made a tremendous amount of sense. And then our start date would be three months after the ratification by both boards. So we had adequate time to, to review the budgets. Now, Mike had mentioned we had about 200 members in common. And they're like most chambers, uh, if, you look at your, if you look at your financials, you're going to see that probably 10% of your membership may be responsible for about 40% of your budget. Uh, we had to sit down with those folks and ask them to hold us harmless. Um, if they were writing a $30,000 check to the Bristol County Chamber and a $25,000 check to, the, to uh, the South Coast Chamber, we wanted them to write a $55,000 check as if the two entities were still separate and still fund us at that same level. That was essential for us as we went to build our budgets because without that hold harmless, without those uh, bigger companies that were saying, okay, we see the value in this and it's worth the continued investment, we would have been in deep trouble of being able to make the budget work. Uh, next slide. So when we came together, uh, the committee and our, our, as we put this all together, we had resolutions and bylaws were approved in September of 2019 which probably would have been July of 2019, but a couple health issues got in the way, um, which slowed us down a little bit. Um, you know, we developed a holding company structure, leaving the existing entities intact, uh, but we transferred all the assets and liabilities to the new holding company. The combined board meetings began in September of 19. Uh, the combined budget and work plan was approved in November, late November, early December, and we actually launched uh, on January 1st of 2020, and everything was going along swimmingly. And then as you all know, in March, COVID-19 came to visit. And so now we're, uh, we're in the process of facing new challenges going forward, uh, but that's essentially how we went through our process. And we'd be happy, of course, to answer questions uh, once Jeff completes his presentation. Okay, Great. thanks. Well, thank you. Jeff, why don't you go ahead? Sounds good. Well, thank you guys. A tough act to follow there. Appreciate you and, uh, sharing some great uh, lessons learned there and hope I can add to it and reinforce uh, several things that uh, you mentioned uh, as well there too. 
Um, you know, w w just to give you a little frame of reference for where we are, I I've got a map here, uh, uh, part of my first slide, um, that just kind of shows our geography. And this looks, you know, this could be any state, any town, USA, right? You sort of have the, uh, the, the service area there in the middle and you have a broad influence. So people ask us the geography that we cover, we say it's a flex geography. I stole that from a chamber leader in Connecticut, by the way, I didn't come up with it myself. But, but our suppliers and our customers and our employees come from this broad geography. So, so in everything we do, we gotta be thinking about that broader geography, not just about um, the individual community. I've been lucky to have a board of directors <laughs> that's seen that. Um, and I have that sort of the unique challenge then too that many of you do as well of a state line being in the middle of that uh, too. So the yellow line there is is Michigan up north and Indiana down south. And so, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that relationship here shortly. You know, on the next slide, you'll see that, uh, uh, you know, obviously we're known for the University of Notre Dame. And uh, so, you know, other, and we had a presidential candidate from here too. And I think both of those things have raised the <laughs> profile of our area uh, pretty significantly in, in recent years. Uh, for, for you old timers on the call, you may remember Studebaker. Uh, we were the home of Studebaker uh, many years ago. And, and, and like many old Midwest Rust Belt kind of towns, we've been working to recover from economy for, uh, for several years and such. So um, it, advance one more slide, if you don't mind. <laughs> And my apologies, I'm battling a little bit of a, a cold. I promise I'm not uh, positive. I'm not breathing on anybody through their internet uh, here right now. And I just, I'm a little, get a little choked up uh, sometimes. But our platform is pretty broad. And so I, so we're a chamber, we're, we're an economic development organization and we're a visitor bureau. And then recently we've added another chamber of commerce and economic development organization just across the state line in Niles, Michigan. Niles is a smaller community adjacent to South Bend. But business leaders in Southwest Michigan recognize how important the South Bend economy was to what they were doing. That they, they recognize they're very much part of our economy and, and have, have tapped us to, uh, to work with them. And I'll go into some details there. Um, as, as I mentioned here on the next slide, the, uh, um, the, our, our mission from the beginning is, is regional prosperity. And it's pretty simple and, uh, and it um, allows us to focus on a lot of different um, things. And we have been, uh, a, a key advocate and catalyst for what's happening in the region here uh, for, for, for quite a few years. Um, next slide, we're like many of you accredited um, through the US Chamber, we're a five-star accredited chamber. To be honest, that gave me a little bit of credibility when other organizations or chambers were thinking about um, merging. And uh, so um, th they came to us primarily because they felt like we were a well-run um, organization and that accreditation uh, helped there. Before I talk more specifically about ours, though, on the next slide, I just want to make sure you're aware of, of some great ACC resources. And, and obviously, uh, Sherry Ann and um, Susan and the whole team at ACC can be a great help to you. There's been some great articles in, uh, in past chamber executive magazines and such. And so I'd encourage you to, to take advantage of those. Many people around the country have um, shared their experiences and, and such in there. And, and so I've learned most of my stuff from you uh, across the country who've shared your things and, and please take advantage of ACC and, and what they're doing. Um, next slide there, please, Susan. All right, um, oh, just another example of the ACC resources there. Okay, so let me, um, I'm sorry, I got my slides off just, just okay, I'm back now. All right, so I mentioned uh, mergers, uh, you know, taking, when you look at them across the country, it's chamber, 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 e, chamber, CVB, ED, CVB, uh, even business associations. So like uh, we've really, um, in Michigan, have the chamber ED model and in Indiana, the chamber ED, CVB model. And, uh, you know, it, and I think what's interesting is it's different for every community. What's right for your, your community uh, may not be right for my community and stuff. Figure it out. Uh, and, and I used to, uh, you know, tell our folks that we either have to figure this out or someone else might have to figure it out for you. Rick was talking a little bit about, you know, the parking lot conversations that happen and and uh, and we merged ED about uh, eight years ago and there were a lot of parking lot conversations happening at that time and and we had sat down at the time with the ED folks and said uh, either we figure this out or someone else is going to figure this out for us and and he chose to let let someone else 
uh, figure that out uh, for them. And I, and I think, uh, uh, you know, so be sensitive to what, what people are saying and, uh, and, uh, and listen to, you know, to what your members and, and such are, are doing and, and figure out what that right, what that right model is. You know, I, I, when I think of mergers, I think, you know, you do them for two reasons. You're either desperate or you're aspirational. And so on the next slide there, I just threw those two words. Remember those two words, because, you know, sometimes in Niall's case, for example, they were desperate. Uh, they were an organization about ready to go out of business after a hundred years. They didn't have much resources to do what they uh, needed to do. There were a lot of duplication of resources. They said, boy, we got to do something here. We're going to go out of business. Um, others that you've seen around, you know, our taking over ED was aspirational. Um, our launch of CVV and our keeping it um, with us from the beginning has been very aspirational too. And and, and again, I, I stole this term also, uh, um, uh, One Zone in Carmel, Indiana, Mo Murhoff, who many of you know, ran that for a long time. They merged two chambers uh, down there. And, and, and really that was the, do we want to, uh, um, are we desperate or, or are we aspirational? And I, so, so I hope as you're having these conversations, it's because you're aspirational that you want to better serve your community, want to better use business resources and, uh, um, and, and do the right things there. Next slide there, please, Susan. So just a, a quick, you know, we're 100 years old, CVB with us from the day one, Lido uh, since 2012. And, and many of you, you know, this is kind of this funny cycle in the chamber world. Many of you started the economic development. Most of them split out from you uh, back in the 1980s. And I think the trend will be them coming back again. So I would encourage you to, to look at those. Similar in Niles uh, to 100 year old organization that uh, split out um, merged back together. And then we actually, when we, we merged the two organizations into one and then came uh, to working with us. And in 2008, we started uh, with a contract for services and now working on the, on the full merger there. Next slide there, please. All right. So, you know, so in our, our case in South Bend, it's, it's just, you know, we're one voice. We, we limit the bureaucratic overhead. We share everything, you know, across our platform. You know, we rent one building. We have one controller. We have uh, one front desk person, one copier. Yeah, I mean, it, all the things that you can think of, um, uh, it, you know, why, why they'd be beneficial and where you can share some costs o over the broad platforms. We obviously have a number of different funding sources that come in, um, but uh, but to manage those all in one really keeps that overhead low. Um, our stakeholders uh, are, are very involved. You know, I think, you know, as you're merging, that's one of those things, you know, the ED and chamber, for example, the ED stakeholders are afraid they're going to get left out, that the chamber has different priorities. They don't care about economic development and they're bringing the wrong kind of jobs there, which, is, which isn't true. But we, you know, we've found ways to make sure we incorporate those volunteers into a lot of different ways so that uh, that they feel meaningful engagement and that they lead that strategy. So, so our economic development group, for example, still leads strategy. The chamber board is the overall um, uh, official, if you will say, but but for the most part, we, uh, uh, we, we keep those all together. We fold those together. So if you go one more slide there. In Niles, very similar, uh, you know, like I said, they were going out of business almost. They really didn't have much resources, obviously very small too. So they didn't have many resources coming in. And with an ED group and a chamber and most funders who couldn't figure out what, if anything, that either one of them did. And so that's when they reached out to us and said, boy, I wonder if you could help. You know, they knew about our, our success in South Bend. We're very much part of the same media market and such. So they see a lot of what we're doing down this way. And, and, th and we, you know, made this interesting decision to date uh, before we got married. And, uh, and I highly recommend that, uh, whether we're talking chamber or anything else, right? <laughs> that, uh, that we all sort of think of that, uh, you know, as being a, 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 you know, very similar. And Mike mentioned it in, in his comments uh, early on that, you know, we, you know, we got to figure out where we can uh, do better together. And, and they, and, and as Rick and Mike shared, you know, kind of let, let's find some ways that we can work together and partner first. Let's see how this might work uh, before we uh, decide on, on, on something else. And, and uh, so in our case there, for example, that's exactly what we did. Uh, next slide there, Susan. So, um, so, so again, I, I think our challenge in Niles was merging 
two organizations first. So we had two sets of books, two, two sets of staff, two different computer systems, two different offices, all those kind of things. But, but a board of directors who had no, no qualms about putting together, we took seven from one, seven from the other. Uh, we had sort of equal representation on our board of directors and, uh, and, and those 14 were in consensus about the partnership uh, with South Bend, as I mentioned, because they're part of this urbanized um, area. And then they made this, you know, this interesting decision to, to make the South Bend CEO, the Niles CEO as well too. Knowing that as a small organization, it's really hard to, you know, attract a, a CEO at the level that they wanted. And, and so, you know, I would call this the bank model. So think about, think a little bit about what banks do. Banks in their home offices centralize certain services. You know, they, it's HR, it's IT, it's marketing. It's all of those things. And then they have branches that serve the communities out there. So, you know, so in our case in, in Niles, you know, I have a staff of 17 in uh, in South Bend that, uh, that Niles now has access to. So they go from having really two staff members having 17. Obviously, I don't assign all 17 of them there all the time, but they thought, wow, this is pretty good for us. We're buying into this greater, uh, this greater, bigger organization. We can't afford a graphic designer. We can't afford web designer, those kind of things. And so let us, uh, um, you know, connect on those kind of things to, uh, to help benefit uh, us. And, and so that's proven to be real good. And what we've realized is our members don't really care where the newsletter comes from. We don't advertise that it gets, you know, that it gets or the website gets updated or, or whatever. But we do maintain a presence, a branch, if you will, in Niles, uh, still called Niles uh, Chamber, uh, still with Niles business leaders uh, leading it, setting strategy, developing, uh, you know, board of directors. But we just do a lot of the support uh, from our South Bend office there. Uh, next slide, please. So you know the dating before marriage thing worked really well, and uh, and it, you know, but it also gave me a chance to see if it was worth the effort, right? You know, I, so I hadn't done this before. I didn't know what this was going to look like. I developed a, a contract for services. I came up with an hourly rate and just said, we're, you know, this is the hourly rate we're going to charge for our time in Niles. And, uh, and and what was interesting is on some weeks. Uh, when I spent a lot of time on Niles, I felt like my organization was losing money uh, in South Bend big time. And other weeks, we, you know, we probably made some. And our hope was that we balanced, you know, time out amongst our staff to make it worth the while. Um, especially up front when you merge, there's a lot more time and effort and energy uh, that, it, that it takes to, to make that happen. And, and so we did spend a lot more time in, in, in the early days. But I think what... Um, what, what Niles also realized at the time was, I mean, I mean, I think they liked the back office support. They loved our talented team right away. The the look of newsletters, of websites, of communications, even of the quality of events really uh, improved. We were a lot more efficient. We had a billing system, a, 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 a CRM system, all kinds of things that we didn't really have before. And they still had their own identity. But what they also realized was that um, when I when I began to exceed the hours that we'd budgeted in the course of a week, um, it now was sort of the second priority, if you will, right? It, it's uh, because I'm losing money if I spend too many extra hours um, on this, and so we knew we had to find a solution to that, and that's why uh, merger is is in the works right now. So, how about next slide there? You know, so just, uh, you know, a couple lessons um, that, that, that I would learn because because this Niles thing has open, you know, if you will, in, in our case, it's been a little bit of a test. Um, and, and we've had about six other communities reach out to us to consider something very similar uh, in this area. Now, some of them geographically don't make sense to us. They're just, we're detached too far uh, from them. Uh, some of them do make some sense. And so we gotta, we're kind of going through this process right now of, of deciding where else to go. We've got to listen to our stakeholders. Um, we, we think that in this post-COVID world, unfortunately, investors are going to be looking to invest less in organizations like yours and mine, uh, not more. And, uh, and so we got to figure out what the right solution to that is. And if we can centralize some, some look and feel and message and process and, and programming and stuff, we think that that's um, going to be a really good thing. Um, as Rick and Mike both talked about, making sure that the right parties are at the table, that people don't feel like they're losing. I was pretty lucky because I didn't have a, a CEO in, in Michigan, for example, that I had to worry about. Or, or um, even in South Bend, when we uh, merged ED, uh, my CEO in ED was retired 
hiring. So it, you know, uh, it, so staff changes sometimes are great times uh, to look at whether whether it makes sense there, and and so we're able to uh, do that. But we wanted to make sure, especially in all of this, and nobody felt like they were losing uh, something in this. And, and, and you know, it, it's it's funny. I think sometimes in nonprofit world, uh, people take off their business hats when they walk in the room, and uh, and, and and you know, we're a business organization. We had to make the business case. Business leaders respond to that. So the bank model, the fact that we laid it out uh, that way, the idea that they were going to centralize services, the fact that we were going to eliminate the duplicative overhead um, was were all really interesting points. One thing I'd mentioned too, and Rick hit this earlier, that's really critical. He talked about holding harmless. That was absolutely our pitch as, as well too. Because the danger for me was that it's just as soon as Niles and South Bend came together, all those big funders said, oh good, I don't have to write as big of a check uh, anymore. And what we suggested was we need you to at least hold us harmless for a year. Uh, similar on ED, and, and when we merged that many years ago, was that uh, you need to give us some time to work in those efficiencies and find some cost savings. I think every one of our ED investors invests less now than they did. That's not, I'm not proud of that. I don't think that's a great uh, thing, but we, but part of it is because we run a more efficient organization than we did many years ago. So make sure you you take Rick's advice there and and make, and make and try to hold harmless, especially as you put together that first year, because because you will have that big bank who's the largest investor in both uh, communities who now wants to write one check in, instead of two. I, I mentioned dating and marriage too many times already, uh, but, uh, but but, uh, but contracts for services are a great way to do things, especially if there's a smaller chamber around. If you wanted examples of that, I'd be happy to share uh, the contract we use just to give you a, a base for that. Um, and then just reach out to those who have done it before. There's some good models, some great advice. I mentioned ACCE also as a great resource um, as well too. So um, so I, that's my, and like Rick and Mike, I'm happy to answer some, uh, some questions if they're more specific questions about how that. And then finally, we're hoping that there will be college football uh, this fall, beginning September 12th against Arkansas, I think, if there are any Arkansas fans out there. Um, and I don't think the stadium will look exactly like that, but uh, we'd love for you to come see us in South Bend sometime. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff and Rick and Mike. I hope everyone can hear me a little bit better now. Um, I changed my mic. Um, so folks, now it's time to ask questions. If you have any, please go ahead and type your questions in your question box. Um, you can go ahead and type now and I will read them out to our panel. Um, in the meantime, uh, just a reminder that the, hand, the handouts or the, the presentation slides, slide deck is already posted on the webinar panel. So you can go ahead, click on handouts, um, download that and you'll have it in front of you. I'll also post it with the recording. Um, we have one question. Uh, Jeff, did the university play a role in your merger? Uh, so the university is the largest investor that we have in our organization, um, and uh, they have been the driver of most of the regional thinking. Um, so it, it, partly because they're Switzerland, right? They, uh, they, they're they neutral. They're not paying taxes in any of the communities. They rely on the whole region. Their faculty is, is living here. They need the quality of place to be there. So, so they're very much at the table at all of them and have encouraged that regional thinking. And, and they're the one or organization in our team, in our community, that can call a meeting and everybody's going to show up regardless of what the topic is. So think about that when you're, you know, contemplating this. Who are some of the key stakeholders in your community that, that if they called, um, people would show up? Because I think you need a few of those folks to help, you know, the, the uh, and, and so in, in our case, that's the, that's the, 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 really the defining role they play where they're the, the key convener and then the, and then the regional advocate. And they've really taught people to, to think broader than just their individual communities. And if I could add on to that as well, we have uh, UMass Dartmouth, which is almost exactly halfway between uh, New Bedford and Fall River. Uh, they have been a regional force and they're becoming more of a regional force as we uh, make some economic development transitions into alternative energies here in the form of offshore wind. Uh, we've also had a community college system with representation in both communities and a hospital system, uh, South Coast Health, which has hospitals in New Bedford and Fall River we were able to take advantage of the fact that the uh, the urge for regionalization was already underway. Uh, it had been led by the academics and, and the corporates. 
Uh, the banking community, of course, was, was fully regionalized. That allowed us the luxury of being able to, to uh, uh, fall to some degree along their coattails. Uh, they had already begun that process. Mike and I were able to, uh, to kind of glom onto that. But a little bit different from Jeff, one of the big issues that we had to deal with in terms of, while the same time we were trying to have hold harmless conversations with our big guys, we were fending off questions from some of our little, our smaller, smaller members who were scared to death that the big boys were gonna take over everything as we came together into this larger organization. So we were actually had to, to some degree, had to fight a bit of a two front war, uh, but it worked out incredibly well, I think in both regards. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, did you have to make governance compromises such as guaranteeing guaranteeing board seats? I think this is to Jeff, um, but to, uh, because I think Rick, you covered this in your presentation, but anyone who wants to tackle that, go ahead. Sure, yeah, in, in each case, so, so Niles, for example, initially as we brought the chamber and ED together, we just simply agreed that um, we would go half and half. So seven ED uh, board members and seven chamber board members would uh, survive the merger and be part of the leadership. Um, their initial discussion about including everybody but a large manageable, unmanageable board didn't make much sense. And so they uh, were able to get to them to agree on, a, on an actual number there. And then when our ED and chamber came together, there was not that such a thing. However, I, I'd say that was more because we had so much duplication already. There were quite a few people who sat on both boards and that's where you know the parking lot conversation was happening we're saying man i'm writing a big check to both of these i'm going to both of these meetings it seemed like they do a lot of the same stuff and so we didn't have to make um, those kind of compromises on the chamber ed merger okay um so to to uh, any of the panel, uh, this is a great question. What's the first list of items you need to consider as you start to think about merger or marriage? <laughs> but I think merger, marriage as a type of yeah. merger. When you when you consider a merger, I think first first and foremost you have to think about what why would you do this? What are your own strengths and weaknesses, and what are the other organization's strengths and weaknesses? And does the community want it to happen? And by the community, it's not, I don't just mean the board but the, um, and stakeholders, but you have to look externally. Who's not on the board, but who would be big stakeholders? You gotta look at it, you gotta talk to them. And then as what worked for us well, the first thing that we really started to do was go back and look at why did it fail? Because we, ha we had that circumstance where it failed. Other, other communities, uh, other chambers across the country, you may have tried it in the past, just because it failed doesn't mean it's going to fail now. The world does change. And, and Rick mentioned in our case, you know, we had Bristol Community College, we had UMass Dartmouth and uh, South Coast Health. They had all regionalized since 2006. Uh, as, and many of the banks that were either based in Fall River had opened branches and had expanded to New Bedford and vice versa. So there were things that had changed in the 10 to 12 year period um, when, when we started looking at this. So you really have to look and talk to your community and you have to look at what your strengths and weaknesses are because one of the things that we realized, Rick and I realized, and when we started to bring the two teams together to talk about this, we, we realized that some of the things that they were really good at, we're not really good at and vice versa. We had some really great uh, committees. Edu we, we did great things in the, in the education field. We had one of our board members is a great believer in education as the foundation of economic development so we really did well with that and we sold a lot of corporate sponsorships new bedford south coast they didn't really have any corporate sponsors but they had they had a lot of sponsors for the events and their events were better and well attended than ours so as we started to look at those types of things we said okay how do you make this work and when we said when we when we you know we ended up with the same number of people and we were looking for impact over efficiencies, but that doesn't mean we weren't looking for operational efficiencies. We wanted to look at the staff and say, okay, if, if you were in Bristol and you were responsible for the events, what you're really going to do now is you're going to sell a lot more sponsorships because you're great at selling sponsorships and the person who was running events for New Bedford um, was great at running events. So now you take those two people's strengths, you put it together, and we're doing really well 
And as a result, when everything's gone virtual now, we actually have a great salesperson selling a lot of uh, sponsorships for virtual events, virtual town halls, networking events, and all those kinds of things. So while we're taking a hit, we're not taking quite the hit that we could have taken. Yeah, and if I could also add something, because I think I think this is important in this discussion as well. Um, Mike had mentioned in one of the slides that we used an outside consultant. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, Mike and I could have led that group of people through the exact same process without that outside consultant. Um, but one of the things that I think is a is a go to for a lot of people is is to allow the chief executive, if possible, to take a bit of a step back and not be leading the discussion. Uh, because you never know what's in people's minds as to whether or not there's an assumption uh, that they're being led to a conclusion. Uh, be, we use that outside consultant to give us the credibility of, and free us up actually to make points or to or to have conversations uh, within that committee that might, that otherwise might not have happened. And so we were really pleased to have that outside consultant. Mike said it was a substantial investment, and it was uh, for an organization of our size. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, I think it was money well spent in the sense that it took us out of the conversation and allowed actually the greater good to emerge. The only thing I would add to, we didn't do the consultant route, but it wasn't that we weren't with outside advice. And so we tapped the university, for example, because the universities have some great expertise uh, with folks who can do some uh, facilitation. And, and, and although it wasn't the specific merger uh, piece itself it was the change in thinking you know we needed a uh, we needed a crisis in some ways you know to sort of get us moving we, you know Newsweek put us on the uh, top 10 dying city list in like 2010 or 11 or something like that and that was kind of a, 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 a call to action by our folks it got leaders sitting around the table it got them thinking about how we do some things different it got them thinking about who we wanted to be and 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 uh, and uh, and, and so, it, you know, really move things in the right direction. I, you know, I will caution you, though, it, it, it isn't without bruises along the way. You know, there there are, uh, you know, uh, some some folks that, that, that are going to, you know, you try to keep everybody happy, you can. It's impossible to, uh, to keep everybody um, happy. And so you have to be prepared, you know, for those as well. But but ultimately, um, use that expertise because I do think it's really helpful. And, and I know when, you know, like I said, I didn't have a, a CEO, but I know when we've taught that I was, you know, a, another CEO. CEO that I was working with, but um, the you know many times the the business community comes in with a bias and so well, yeah well Rick and Mike are just trying to both protect their own jobs and so who knows what we're gonna you know get to here and, and such and so I, I do think that does free them up and takes that doubt out and is really helpful and some great advice. Uh, there, um, we have a follow up question on consultants. Is it better to use a consultant that's local and knows the history or an outsider? Uh, this the person asking the question is thinking of a four chamber merger for their entire county. We actually used a, a consultant from uh, upstate New York because we didn't we couldn't find somebody in Massachusetts who we felt had the background and knowledge, and we actually used somebody from New York who had helped other uh, two other chambers at that time come together, uh, and and we really thought the model was well done, um, so we went with somebody out of state. I, I think outside comes with no bias uh, to doesn't already have relationships with people that are sitting around the table is, isn't afraid to say something because they might not get hired for you know some a client or somebody they're already working for in the region so I I would suggest outside is better too. Uh, can you um, Rick and Mike can you let us know who your consultant was? There was a question about that. It was, it was a company in uh, based in Albany, New York, uh, Nikon. Uh, I forget. I forget it's the, the New York I'm Council trying. of Nonprofits. That's it. Doug Sauer. We can send. We can get you his contact information. Absolutely. He did a very good. He did a very good job. But like we said, we could. He helped. A, he helped the board ask the questions and facilitated the board asking the questions. Um, and he gave them all the bad answers. We gave them all the good answers. He gave them the tough answers that they didn't want yes. to hear. <laughs> Okay, if you um, if you all ha need uh, specific information about the consultant that uh, Rick and Mike used, um, I will have contact information on the last slide. Um, you can chat more about that. Um, let me see here. 
how do you combine a chamber and an economic development group with different funding sources, like government funding? Yeah. Uh, you know, just very carefully is probably the, probably the easiest answer. Um, so I would say our economic development funding, probably 70 or 80 percent had been from private sector and about 30 percent uh, from the public sector. The chamber obviously does things that uh, can be upsetting to local officials sometimes, especially in your advocacy space. We, for example, endorse candidates. And uh, sometimes the county council that votes on ED funding doesn't like that they didn't get uh, the endorsement for us. And, and so everybody says, stay away from it. Sometimes you just gotta try stuff and, and, and see how it goes. There are, you know, if we, if we uh, waited years to figure out all the what ifs, uh, we probably would never do anything. And, and so, we, you know, we just carefully balance that. You know, we've set, we try to keep those funds separately. We can show, you know, where we spend those funds if needed or questions. We have contract for services with each of the local government units to sort of with some clear deliverables and, and and stuff on that so i think that that just helps to do that but yeah that isn't without uh some concern and that again that's a bruise you know probably along the way um i'm not sure that we lost any funding because of that we certainly got beat up on the council floor probably once or twice because we in their minds we had endorsed the wrong uh candidate but 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 we think it's important to endorse candidates and we think it's important to have a a, a an economic development effort that it, that's outside of the city and so we've just found a way to make both of those work i, I never forget if you don't get beat up you're not relevant mm -hmm. uh okay here's a good question what's the one thing you would do differently and do you know of any chambers that have merged with other associations as opposed to other chambers um and if so what kind of associations I'd say I'd start earlier. Um, you know, again, I'll go back to ED, for example. We we're having this conversation in 2010, and uh, and we really were pushing for some changes happening then. And in fact, when I came, to, that's when I came to the chamber, and and it had been a problem for 20 years. And I said, I don't want to be sitting here 20 years from now having the same conversation. We got to figure this out. So even in my final interview, I sat down with the ED lead and the chamber lead to talk about how we we're going to fix this. Um, unfortunately, um, there wasn't a sense of urgency from the ED folks, and um, and and so what happened was on you know December 12th. They didn't have enough money to go past the first of the year. They closed the door down. They spent the final million dollars that they had in their uh, bank account. So rather than that coming over to me to help continue to do economic development, that just went away. And and uh, I, and I, I might have approached the ED chamber a little bit different uh, because because uh, at the end, I, I mean, I ended up had to let people know that this they were let, getting let go two weeks after Christmas and uh, and that. Um, uh, because we didn't have money. And then I had a slow start on ED because we didn't have the resources needed. Typically on an ED, you're doing capital resource campaigns that go three or four or five years out and, and such. And, and we just needed to push that harder. I tried hard to get the ED lead to do some things. I probably should have spent a little more time with my board and his board trying to get them together. Yeah, and we, we kind of look at things, both Mike and I look at this in the same way, is that we don't look at anybody as a competitor. Uh, so we don't, we, our mindset is really about how can we collaborate for the better interest of the business community, right. uh, which sometimes means checking your ego at the door. Um, we're fortunate that we don't have the challenge of uh, large amounts of public dollars that are flowing in, into the organization with the exception of a small amount of public dollars that go to support tourism and our CBB. Uh, but, the, but the reality for it is that we look at other associations uh, as people with whom we can collaborate so that even if if another association came forward and said um, as has happened already um, you know maybe we'd like to be under your umbrella uh, obviously COVID has kind of put a halt on some of those conversations for the moment uh, but we could be wide open to that and have them have associations or organizations under our umbrella uh, as long as there's a compatible mission and as long as it's treated in, the, in, in a collaborative manner. I think it all goes to what uh, Jeff had said earlier about desperation or aspiration. Um, we're very much an aspirational organization. When we came together, we were both very strong, which, we, which helped us. But that doesn't mean that we can't help somebody who may be desperate or may be nearing desperation. But um, it's got to be aspirational. 
the way Jeff described, and it and you really it's but it's got to make sense too. You don't want to you don't want to really join forces with an organization that that their um, their mission and their values are nothing like yours, and geographically they're 80 miles away or 50 miles away. You got to be careful about those. Things. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. Um, uh, the next one is: If you had an opportunity to take over or merge with another chamber that was not profitable or was had a poor financial position, in your opinion, would that immediately exclude them from consideration, or are there other factors you'd strongly consider? I think there's other just, factors that we'd strongly consider, and some of it goes to what a lot of that falls under the way Jeff described his uh, his mergers. Um, it all depends on what the what the possibilities and the potential is. And and in our circumstance, I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of, and I think too many organizations, particularly organizations under stress, look at it and say, well, it's about us. Well, it actually isn't about us. Uh, we are a service organization to a broader to a broader group of people and a and a broader group of companies. Uh, so. As we look as we look at a situation like that, would we like to acquire somebody's debt? No, um, but the, but the reality for us is that we would love to be able, uh, if another organization came along and it made sense for the mission of the organization. Uh, if you're getting into mission creep, that's a whole different deal. Uh, but if it makes sense for the mission of the organization and it's better for the business community, then absolutely we would entertain it. Um, but we would have to, of course, be realistic about what those numbers look like. Yep. Um, we knew ours was risky, and I, I suppose the dating gave us a chance first to um, to, to really assess that risk and, and and figure that out. Still not sure it's super profitable yet, but I think it's on the right track. You know, as we've built the system the way we want to build it, and, and I I think that it's going to be a trend in our area where we're going to see more of these. And, and, and Jeff doesn't have a master plan to take over all the chambers in the region. I want to make sure that that's, you know, that's clear because we have some really phenomenal chamber leaders in our area. But, but what I'm hearing in the parking lot sometimes is, is from those business leaders who would like the bank model uh, to be uh, better implemented across our area where could you centralize a certain amount of surfaces within a home office and not duplicate each of those across the broader platform. So, so um, as, as Mike mentioned earlier, I think, you know, find those places that uh, uh, that where you can work better together, build off of, of, of that. And, and uh, but I, I definitely wouldn't rule me out of, of looking at another opportunity either. Okay, I'll just try to squeeze, squeeze in one uh, last question. Um, how did you go about combining your events and programs together while, without overextending and exhausting your membership? Um, I'm not going to tell you that we haven't, um, we wouldn't have overextended or exhausted our membership because, quite frankly, uh, we came into this uh, with the combined set of events, which constitute for us roughly 43% of our budget, uh, with a combined set of events with several sacred cows in there, uh, so that if certain events just had to continue to exist. We came together with those, and when we did, uh, we were going to be a little bit more event heavy than we were before. Um, and we don't, we never got to the point, quite frankly, because events got halted. We never got to the point where we got to find out if there was that uh, exhaustion. Uh, it could happen, uh, but we were mindful of it as we were putting together both our calendar and as we were putting together the events uh, to keep the ones that were the most profitable, to keep the ones that uh, were sacred cows, if need be, uh, and find ways of enhancing those and making them better so that people walked away from the experience more excited. But like every other small area, uh, we represent 18 cities and towns, but it, 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 it's a small, relatively small area. Uh, there's a finite amount of sponsor resources. And so you have to be mindful of that as you go ahead with that process. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, Rick, Mike, Jeff, uh, your perspective um, on mergers and acquisitions and your great advice. Thank you everyone for your questions. If we didn't get to your question, I'll do my best to um, uh, get uh, answers to you. Um, and uh, so so wait, watch for that in the next couple days. 
Um, uh, Jeff mentioned ACCE resources on mergers, and I wanted to point out a few that we have um, that are available on our website. Uh, we have a convention session that was held in July on mergers and alignment, um, a, another webinar we did in 2018 that, that was very good, and uh, we have the recording and presentation slides on our website. Um, uh, the article, The Urge to Merge, to 2012, but still has some good stuff in it. Um, I have the link there and the information page on alliances and partnerships, um, and you can uh, check that out as well. Um, in the meantime, uh, uh, just a reminder that this webinar was recorded, and I will post the recording and the, um, the handouts on our webinar page no later than uh, this Friday, and hopefully before then. So, um, and here are our panelists contact information. Uh, if you'd like to follow up with them, I'm sure they would not mind. Um, and thank you again, all of the panelists, for participating. Um, thanks, all of you, as well. Our next webinar is going to be next Wednesday at 2 p.m., when we are going to cover best practices for building your investment base, investment base for the next normal. Um, two of uh, your membership peers will share how they're recruiting members to join their missions to promote economic recovery and build prosperous futures. So, selling in, in light of COVID, uh, through COVID, past COVID. So that will be our topic next Wednesday. Uh, thanks again, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, we will see you on the next ACC webinar. Bye-bye.